Greetings friends, it's Jesse here, coming at you with another Spirit of Prophecy video. And in this video, we're actually going to be going into um, some Bible study here. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to do a brief overview of preterism, you know, just so we can just quickly glance over that. And uh, so we can finish off that portion, this that portion of the study. Um, and then we're going to jump into looking at Daniel chapter 9. Now, the important thing to notice is that when the Jesuit Francisco Ribera ended up formulating the Futurist School of Thought, okay, as we will see here in just a few, mo few moments, it was done in the notion of creating a different scenario that would counter the movement that would counter the interpretation of the papal system the Roman Catholic Church the papacy as antichrist and therefore they proposed a different school of theology that would take away from that and they would put the Antichrist into the future and the only basis they came up with with that claim was Daniel chapter 9 27 <clears throat> basically explaining the aspect and this is where we get the theories of like the gap theory that you know the 69th week was cut off and the 70th week is going to resume once the church has been raptured that's basically how this doctrine turned into what it is today okay um, but the question is you gotta remember at the beginning of this playlist at the beginning of the series I made mention of a verse that stated that prophecy of scripture is without is not with private interpretation okay so we have to look within scripture to see rather the 70 weeks is a consecutive continuous block of time as what was originally believed or is there a gap in between the 69th and 70th week and we will, be, we will be doing that in depth in part two. Part one, we're just going to go over Daniel 20, 9, 24. And we're going to read the preceding 23 verses. Um, which was uh, which was a prayer of repentance, essentially. Um, and out of that earnest prayer, the man Gabriel, man called Gabriel came unto Daniel and revealed to him this prophecy and so that's basically what we're going to be covering here in this video before we do that I just want to go over very quickly the aspect of preterism which is not really relevant too much today because again futurism is is really in a nutshell it is is what the contest is against and 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 the whole aspect of everything is based on deception okay so <clears throat> and everybody and I mean all denominations that uh, look at prophecy and these types of things for the most part I mean 99% of these denominations out there will sit there and say rather they're pre-rapture mid-rapture post-rapture that you know, the seven years of tribulation or the three and a half years of tribulation comes from a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. That that God is not done with the Jews and so therefore there was a church age that was kind of put in the slot and then once that church age is done away is gone 
then the 70th week of Daniel will recommence and there will be a, an individual that will make a covenant with Israel for seven years and then after, after three and a half years he will be cut off or he will, he will break that covenant you know, and these types of things. And what futurists believe, which means, okay, well, if this man's going to make this covenant, and they do and they do say that this man is the Antichrist, then there has to be a literal temple that he sits in. And so now, they look at other verses, such as Second Thessalonians, and, and, you know, and these types of things. And Revelations chapter 11, talking about the temple of God, they look at Second Thessalonians and say, see, this is where that one boogeyman individual is going to sit in a literal rebuilt temple because Paul affirms this but as we have clearly went over in 2nd Thessalonians that this temple of God is not a literal temple for Jesus Christ the Son of God dwells not in temples made with hands neither does the Father okay that that period was finished when the temple was rent from top to bottom, never to be repeated. Okay, so, but, but before, I mean, I'm digressing a little, but that's just basically the, the scope of this. So, anyway, <clears throat> I want to go over Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 real quick, because I thought this was a very good uh, text to start off with uh, in this video. And it states, and he gave some apostles... This is basically the, the titles of individuals within the body of Christ. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. You know, so there, there are different facets within the body. You have some that are inspired preachers. You know, you have some that are pastors, apostles. You have evangelists, and these types of things. And what are they for? They are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's their job. Is 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 perfecting the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now we have plenty of people out there that consider themselves teachers, prophets, apostles, evangelists, but when you go and look at these mainstream individuals are they really edifying the body of Christ or are they edifying the flesh are they edifying materialistic things okay that's one thing you have to be you know you have to think about and the majority of these people that that are are labeled this are believe in the aspect of this dispensational futurism Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ." Okay, so this is basically going to be the purpose of these next two videos is because, in a way, what's going on today is deception is so rampant and this started to, and the seed was planted by, via the pen of the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, so-called, and now out of that we have children being tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Is this right? Is that right? You have you have prophecy eschatology that teaches prophecy this way and that way and these types of things. But what is the truth? What is the foundation? Because if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so that's what we're going to be doing in this video in Daniel 9. We're going to look at the foundation. And the foundation can really be found in Daniel 9.24. Okay. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted 
by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All right. So here is one of the aspects of being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, because you can get a lot of doctrines out of preterism, and you can get a lot of doctrines that stem forth off of futurism. As long as it agrees in that line of thinking, there is no threat to the feet of iron and clay. Essentially, there's no threat to the beast. As long as you are in the line of either preterism or futurism and keeping clear of histor the, the, the historical school of thought, of interpretation, then regardless of what school you belong in and how you teach that school makes no difference to Rome as long as you believe one or the other and not the, and not the middle not the straight and narrow so basically this was another another counter interpretation to the historical held by the the historicism held by Pro, protestantism anabaptist uh, so so it wasn't just protestantism i'm going to put anabaptists in there i'm going to put the waldensians the albigenses and these types of things they all held to this view of historicism Okay, and here was another counter-interpretation, and it was proposed by another Jesuit named Louis de Alcazar, and he lived from 1554 to 1613. He wrote a commentary called Investigation of the Hidden Sense of the Apocalypse, which ran to some 900 pages, and in it he proposed that, it all, that, that all of Revelation apply to the era of pagan Rome, not the Roman Catholic Church, but pagan Rome and the first six centuries of Christianity. And so basically, in a nutshell, what preterism is, is everything was fulfilled after the destruction of the pagan Roman Empire. And hence, we are living in the millennial reign, so to speak, of Christ, spiritually. Another aspect of preterism is that Christ already had his second coming at the destruction of Jerusalem when the Christians fled and these types of things and now we are in that millennial reign because everything was fulfilled. That's preterism. As much as that doesn't make sense, this is why there's not much credibility given to this school of thought and many people left that bandwagon and jumped onto the futurist bandwagon you know that's why because it's you know there it, it was a I'm not gonna say it was a poor strategy because it did accomplish its goals but it was a strategy that wasn't gonna last very long futurism by far was the most cunning and crafty strategy because <clears throat> all you gotta do is look at the uh all the books and all the commentaries um, just stemming from the 19th century alone from all these mainline denominations and these types of things and I mean you can see flat out but anyways Revelations chapter 1 through 11 it describes the rejection of the Jews and the destruction of the Jerusalem by the Romans this is the preterist view Revelations chapter 12 through 19 were the overthrow of Roman paganism, the great harlot. So the great harlot was not a church, it was, the, it was Roman, it was pagan Rome. And a conversion of the empire to the church. Think of Constantine, okay? Revelation 20 describes the final persecutions by Antichrist, who is identified as Caesar Nero. Now, common judgment would, would make you think that if... If the papacy took upon himself the titles of the Caesars, and preterism is labeling the Antichrist as one of the Caesars, does wouldn't that make you think a little bit? You're like, well, this can't be right. You know, so. Again, that's why there, there's a lot of holes in this, in this teaching. 
Revelation 21 through 22 describes the triumph of the New Jerusalem, the Roman Catholic Church, or, and other preterist views. Um, uh, I think Hank Hanegraaff is one of them, um, and others acknowledges that we, you know, we are establishing the kingdom of God on earth right now. This is what we're doing because everything in the book of Revelation was already fulfilled. There is no time at hand and these types of things. What you know, so we just need to be focusing on establishing the kingdom of God on earth. You know, it, it's it's called dominion theology. And so that's basically with the remnants of preterism is what that is. That's where it stems from. It stems from another Jesuit priest. It stems from another pen of the Jesuit order. Just like futurism. And again, Alcazar found no application of prophecy to the Middle Ages or to the papacy. That his interpretation differed so greatly from that put forth by Francisco Ribera or Cardinal Bellarmine mattered little. Catholicism, the supposedly divine and infallible interpreter of scripture, was presenting two vastly different and quite incompatible interpretations of prophecy in a desperate effort to counter the claims of the reformers. And again, what you what what you have to look at here is this is the Jesuit order, mind you, okay? And in their oath, it, it they it's it's you know, it it goes into detail of how you're going to have a group of Jesuits here and a group of Jesuits here. So in the minds, you know, and, and, and this is the learning against learning, this is the Medici learning type aspect, the Hegelian dialectic and these types of things. So you have Alcazar on one, on one end, you have Ribera on the other. And bear in mind they're of the same order, but here they are proposing two different views that totally contradict each other. But what is, and that's thesis and antithesis, and what is the synthesis? Well, the synthesis is basically, is a desperate effort to counter the claims of the reformers, to counter historicism. It is a counter-reformation. And so this is that great Catholic diversion. The intent of both futurism and preterism was to be diversionary, to counter or offset the Protestant historical interpretation and present alternatives no matter how implausible they might be. The result is evident from the following chart which illustrates the three schools of interpretation regarding Antichrist. And here is that chart for you. Basically, long story short, the Dark Ages, Historicism, Reformation, French Revolution all spanned a 1,260 year time period which was a um, time prophecy that equal to time times and a half a time 42 months, um, three and a half um, prophetic years, which would be 1,260 days equals 1,260 years, and these types of things. This was the historicism point of view. You know, this is the view that, you know, I hold. This is the view that, you know, a very small minority now holds. It's not, I mean... It's not that widely believed anymore. And um, <clears throat> and when you look at the case of Scripture, Scripture radically supports this historical thought. It, it does. It doesn't support either the preterism thought or the futurism thought. Futurism, again, is there is a seven-year period of... In, which is which they call is the unfulfilled 70th week of Daniel and in the midst of that seven year period there will be an antichrist figure who um, established a peace treaty or a covenant if you will with the nation of Israel and after three and a half years he would break that covenant and then the great persecution of the Jews would begin the, the church having been raptured and those that are coming to Christ after the rapture are called tribulation saints okay um, which there is no term for tribulation saints in the Bible anywhere and there is no term for a secret rapture anywhere in the Bible but this is basically futurism 
And then after three and a half years, the last three and a half years, you have the visible return of Christ. So Christ comes secretly and raptures his church. You know, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, just like that. I could be sitting here right now and I could be gone. And my clothes would be left behind and these types of things. You've seen the movies, you know how it works. And preterism is basically the opposite. It puts the Antichrist in the distant past. Um to uh, Nero Caesar and after the fall of the Roman Empire that's when the Millennial Kingdom of Christ began essentially and the the rulership of that kingdom falls under the church so therefore the church reigns supreme rules with a rod of iron and these types of things that's preterism Now, the truly amazing part of all this is that the futurist theory, and it does, it dominates Protestant teaching today. All you hear or read about today is the yet-to-appear Antichrist, who will be unveiled in the last three and a half years, sorry about that, of Daniel's 70th week. When he declares himself to be God in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, that scenario, as you can now see, is directly traceable back to the pen of the Jesuit Francisco Ribera, Notice what one Protestant writer had to say over 100 years ago. Next we come to consider the time of the rise of the futurist system as we now have it and the occasion which led to it. So great a hold did the conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist gain upon the minds of men that Rome at last saw she must bestir herself and try by putting forth other systems of interpretation to counteract the identification of the papacy with the Antichrist. Accordingly, towards the close of the century of the Reformation, two of her most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, thesis, antithesis. And the middle ground was a new theology, a new prophetic interpretation for the Protestants. Okay? Namely, that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself to bringing to prominence the preterist method of interpretation, which we have already briefly noticed, and thus endeavored to show that the prophecies of, we went on to the next page, Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled in Rome, and therefore could not apply to the papacy. On the other hand, so here we have the one, and here we have the other. The Jesuit Ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies to the papal power by bringing out the futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Thus, as Alfred says, the Jesuit Ribera, about A.D. 1580, may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern times. It is a matter for deep regret that those who hold and advocate the futurist system at the present day, Protestants as they are, for the most part, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from the detec detection as the Antichrist. And so what do we have today? Sure, we have Protestants exposing Rome, we have Protestants exposing the papacy, but they just, they don't, they no longer agree with him being the Antichrist. He's just a false prophet. You'll hear that, that, that he's the false prophet. You know, that the papal system is the false prophet system, but it's not Antichrist, because the Antichrist is yet to appear. And again, that, that plays well into the hands of Rome because that stems from this futurist thought which was planted by Rome itself via the Jesuit order this is why the Bible strictly states cursed be the man that trusteth the man who maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord 
okay? We have moved away from Scripture so much to the point that we rely on trusting in men to give us the interpretation of Scripture, just like in the Dark Ages when men were really, in a sense, forced to trust other men to present to them the message of the gospel, which was clearly another gospel based on tradition and superstition. But this is what they were forced to believe. Now, even though we still we, we have Bibles in our hands, but this school of thought is so comforting. It's so moving. It seems so right because everybody believes it. And so therefore you have all of these extra theories that are attached to it now. You have, you know, those that are becoming Hebrew scholars and trying to figure out certain math criteria and these types of things. And uh, Chuck Misler is really famous for that one. He goes into great lengths of saying the word here and the, and the origin of this word here can be traced to this point and this proves the rapture. You know, so... <clears throat> so this futurist system is a ever-evolving system and it's going to continue to grow as a deception. Okay. It has been well said that futurism tends to obliterate the brand put by the Holy Spirit upon the pro on the, uh, oh my goodness upon the po upon popery. More especially is this to be deplored at a time when the papal antichrist seems to be making an expiring effort to regain his former hold on men's minds. And that's the whole poor that's the whole context of this entire battle is for the mind of men. Because if you can get, because if Satan get the, can get the mind of men away from true prophecy and true prophetic teachings, then therefore Satan can alter the minds of men into a, accepting a different Jesus, different from that Jesus that's in the Bible. Everything is based on deception. Everything that you see in the churches. Everything you see in the world is based on deception. There's going to be a future video in this series that we're going to be going over the art of war. Okay? And and this is a spiritual war. This is a, it's, it's a war between God, Christ, and Satan and these types of things. But we're caught in the middle of this war because we are made in the image of God. And so, therefore, in order to really hurt God what better way to hurt him than to take his children from him okay and so this is this is really what this war is about it's a war over the minds of men and in the physical realm yes you have the antichrist and you have the followers of Christ So again, and what can only be described as a stunning reversal, Protestants have over time actually become the papacy's greatest ally. So they, you know, as the ends justifies the means. It was successful. You know, regardless of these Protestants are spewing words against the papacy, it doesn't matter. Because guess what? The goal has been completed. No one believes that the papacy is the Antichrist anymore because they believe in a different type of prophecy and so they become the the Protestants have over time have actually become the papacy's greatest ally by spreading its Jesuit spawn propaganda what irony that Protestants who originally broke away from what they clearly recognized to be the harlot antichrist led church of, of prophecy now champion the futurist interpretation from high-profile global ministries. Futurism has without doubt been successful beyond the wildest dreams of its Jesuit authors. The same can be said for the preterist interpretation of Louis de Alcazar, although to a lesser degree. 
so there you have it. So, so here we have. So basically, in the previous two videos and this one, we have gone over the different schools of thought. Okay, and so now we're going to go and look at one of the main things that were that was changed in the futurist school of thought because again in today's world and you know in, in the days and times we live in there are really two compo there are two opposing factions you have the futurist school of thought and you have the historical school of thought those are the only two you know it's like it's the same it's the same thing with what you know that's that's stated in Joshua 24 you're pre you're presented with both of these choose you this day whom you will serve choose you this day what you will believe I'm coming at you from a historical standpoint and so what I'm going to be giving you is what the Bible states regarding the 70 weeks of Daniel now you can take it and you can study upon it and see if these things are so or you can reject it and that's your choice I can't make that choice for you I mean you know you lambaste me call me whatever you know I'm just presenting you with a choice I've already explained to you what the futurist interpretation was and now we're gonna go over the historical interpretation and obviously yes I'm gonna put more emphasis on the historical interpretation because that is where I'm coming from but again you have to make the choice now again as we get started with this study I wanna look at a couple verses here and if you notice in Matthew 24 there are four times that the that Jesus used the word deceive Okay. he used it in Matthew 24 verse 4 and this is the first thing that Jesus stated after the disciples say tell us what should be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world tell us these things Lord and then you know the first thing he answered was take heed that no man deceive you so we need to be paying attention we need to be on guard we need to be watchful you know because there are deceiving men out there that are lying in wait to deceive you. And then he repeats it again in, in the next verse. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Okay, and as I stated before, sure, you can apply this to people that are actually literally claiming themselves to be Jesus Christ, but if you look at the word, the for Christ it means Messiah or it means anointed someone who is anointed okay and so we have a bunch of people that come in the name of Jesus being so called anointed of God but they are deceiving many and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many not few many this is verse 11. In verse 24 it states, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. You want to know how it could be possible? By not being grounded in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, when you look at the book of Revelation, and when you and uh, the angel reveals to John the um, the harlot woman that sits on top of the scarlet colored beast, he he's marveling after it. He 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 fell down and marvel and he said, "Why are you marveling? Babylon has fallen." He was in he he was engraved in in in, in such a wonder. And this was the Apostle John. So don't think that you're above being deceived. You know. 
I mean, obviously the Apostle John had wise counsel, and the angel said, why are you marveling? You know. And so therefore he was, he was snatched away from that trap very quickly. Because what would have happened if he would have continued to marvel? So again, it is possible, you know, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And see, that's the whole point, is deception can come in many different forms. Deception can be so subtle that it can be cloaked in certain garbs that seem right and seem pure and seem logical. Or take, for, for instance, Islam, okay? Here you have the world perceiving Islam as this nasty brute, brute force under the guise of ISIS and these types of things. And we're all looking to ISIS as, you know, but now you have the real enemy behind the scenes coming right up behind you and is pushing their agenda forward. While everyone is focusing on this because they're believing what the media is telling them, well, here comes the real enemy from behind. It's kind of like the thief walking in the back door while you're looking at the front. <clears throat> so, and in another section that this word deceive comes in is Second Thessalonians 2 3. We're going to read 2 3 through verse 12. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now the one school of, of, of thought, those that believe in this tribulation period and the rapture of the church, they will sit there till, and tell you till, you're, till they're blue in the face, that this is a literal temple that is going to be rebuilt and this man that is seeking worship is going to sit in that temple and he's going to call himself God. Now if you're a now if you're a master strategist and a master deceiver how would that even work? People would already know that you're a fraud if someone's going to sit in, you know, in a rebuilt temple of God saying, I'm God. But they know he bleeds red. Okay. Now, if this was talking about sitting in the midst of the temple of God, meaning the aspect of, you know, the true church you know, sitting in the midst of the temple of God because we are the temple of God and here we have an earthly priest that sits on an earthly throne counseling those within the temple of God. And he has doctrines that when he sits in that temple he is to be regarded as infallible. He is to be worshipped. It doesn't necessarily mean just, you know, bowing. Worshipping can just be simply being in agreement with. That is that man of sin. That is that son of perdition. Man of sin and son of perdition can apply to the plural form too. When you look at, you know, the individual. I'm talking just, you know, the common people. And how we as a church act today in a lukewarm state carried around being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and that was the Caesars okay will he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. When pagan Rome was taken out of the way, papal Rome would come up from among it. 
And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So God says he sends them the strong delusion, because they don't want to have a love of the truth, they want to believe a lie, they're gonna, God's going to say, you can have it. You can have it. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, having pleasure in unrighteousness is rejecting the truth. That's, that's part of it. Okay? It's part of it. Now, when I looked up that word sin here in this text, there was something that really stuck out to me. And I want you to... I want you to mark this down in your heads to miss the mark. Okay, because we're going to come to that point here real soon. So I want you to bear in mind this phrase, miss the mark. Okay, just engrave that in, in your minds right now. That we're going to come back to this. That was basically one of the definitions of the word sin regarding the man of sin. Okay. But obviously it can refer to, you know, a collective body of individuals as well. You know, the papal dynasty is a collective body of individuals, isn't it? You know, but um, when you look at, like, the common people and these types of things and, and the deception being rampant and people believing every wind of doctrine and leavened doctrine and these types of things, you know. So we have to kind of look at things as a whole stratagem as well. So in Daniel 9, and again, make sure you have that phrase, Mr. the mark, engraved in your mind because we're going to go back to it. In Daniel 9, which I titled Part 1, A Prayer for His People, because we're going to be reading the verse, the the first 23 verses Daniel realizes that you know the 70 year captivity that the prophet Jeremiah prophesied about you know the captivity in Babylon was about to expire okay and Daniel was in sackcloth and ashes just pleading before God you know confessing his sins and the sins of his people and these types of things. And it's a wonderful prayer and it is a wonderful prayer for us to consider in our day and age, especially the times we're living in and especially the conditions of the church today. So let's go ahead and read this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, so this was after the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon, conquered Babylon. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keep in the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned, and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled even by departing from, the, from thy precepts and from thy judgments. So he prays unto the Lord, makes, makes a confession, and, and, listens, and, and listen to what he says here. It said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. 
we have sinned and have committed iniquity. There are those that today that believe that, you know, the commandments, which is really in a sense the knowledge of sin, are is no longer valid. You know, so, and therefore, how can anybody repent of their sins to Christ if there are no commandments to repent from? Or, or, or to look at to repent for by the law is the knowledge of sin you know that's just one of the you know that's just one of the stages of the church that's wrong with the church today well, that's just one little snippet I mean it's a big snippet but it's a snippet <laughs> we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. They didn't heed the prophet's voice. They wanted smooth words talk, you know, talk to them. Not not these not these strong words that um, didn't tickle the ears. They, they they wanted them to preach unto them smooth things. You know, things that pleased the flesh. Things that pleased the characters of which they were portraying things that please them in a worldly mindset they didn't want any of this chastisement and rebukes from all these prophets so they had they did not hearken unto the servants the prophets which spake in thy name to our kings our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land O Lord righteousness belongeth unto thee but unto us confusion of faces well who's the author of confusion And so can you actually blame the devil for, you know, causing confusion? Or was it the people themselves that brought confusion unto themselves? But unto us confusion of faces as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whether thou hast driven them because of their trespasses that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. When you turn away from the Lord, confusion is always the result. So again, you have a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Don't be lukewarm. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. You can apply this to maybe the spiritual Israel today. They transgress thy law. Even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice, therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Daniel 9.12 And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil, for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our, our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. Simple. You choose not to obey? Evil will come upon you. Choose to obey, evil will be suppressed. Now, in the fleshly mind of that, it may not seem that way, because all you gotta do is look at all look at all the martyrs and the evils that were committed unto them. But in the spirit, what did they gain? They gained eternal life. So what's more important? The life of the flesh? Living the life of the flesh or eternity with Christ? 
tough decision, really. Because the spirit's always willing, but the flesh is weak-minded. Flesh is weak. And so we are a weak-minded people. We are a simple people. Simple-minded, meaning stupid. And we obey not his voice. And now, O oh Lord our God, and just like the same thing that happened to Jerusalem then, the same thing is happening to the church today. Okay, they're not hearkening unto the words of the prophet. They're they're applying these, you know, the prophecies that were spoken by these prophets to distant future times that don't even apply to the church. It applies to another group of people. So I mean, it's the same. It's the same old song and dance. There is no new thing under the sun. Now, O Lord our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renowned, as at this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. So, so how many times here is, has Daniel acknowledged the sin of the, the sins of Israel, the sins of Jerusalem? First, he confessed his sins unto God and his supplications and he does through continuously through this prayer and he continuously acknowledges the sins of the people O Lord according to all thy righteousness I beseech thee let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city, from thy city Jerusalem thy holy mountain because for our sins and for the iniquity here it goes again he just did it again and for the iniquities of our fathers Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate, for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for, this, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed, now, by the way, there was no sacrifices being done. This was just a simple aspect that Daniel knew around the time what the evening oblation would commence, and so therefore, he's given us the illustration that it was around this time frame of the evening oblation when the evening oblation would have taken place okay so by the way so what does that also tell you Daniel did not have the laws he did not have any of these things he did not have the law he did not have you know uh, the Torah you know all, all these rites and rituals he had no means of he had no means of performing these oblations, and yet he's one of these men that can enter into heaven on his own righteousness. So, since he did not have the law, even though the law was still valid in that time, what did he have? He had faith, didn't he? And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So here is a man who did not have the law, who did not have any of the rites and rituals to perform them you know to make to make 
sacrifices and these types of things. And this man is greatly beloved in heaven. What does that say for the Hebrew roots folks? I mean, that's for a way, way further study down the line, but I mean, come on. <clears throat> so now we come to Daniel 9 24. And Daniel 9 24 is basically the vision that Gabriel gives to Daniel. And it's a time prophecy. And this is really the foundation of the next three verses, 25 through 27. And remember, it says in the Psalms, If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Okay? The foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So we're going to read Daniel 9.24. There's a lot of lines we've got to go over. As you can see, you got one, two, three, four, five, six characteristics here that pertain to someone. And it pertains to that someone throughout the entire prophecy, which is 70 weeks. Because it starts off by saying, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And obviously Daniel's people would have been Judah, the Judeans, Jews. And upon thy holy city, physical, literal Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay. <clears throat> so now, we're going to go and look at scripture from all five of these, six of these lines, and we're going to see who this applies to. Does this apply to Antichrist, or does it apply to Jesus Christ? Now question, if this whole prophecy, and I'm talking the whole, because this is 70 weeks, and you take a day for a year, when you look at 70 times 7, it's a very unique verse, by the way, that's a very unique phrase. Peter was asking, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And then Jesus says, nay, but 70 times 7. Very unique. There's seven days in a week. Okay, so you have 70, and you have times 7, 70 weeks times 7, you have 490 days. And then you have the verses in Ezekiel that talks about, I've given you each day for a year. And then in Numbers 14, you each day for a year. This applies to the 1,260 days or time times and a half a time, and it also applies here to the 70 weeks of Daniel. Okay. There's some that make that, that make the claim that it also applies to the 2300 days. You know, I'm I'm still on the fence on that one, but <clears throat> regardless of that, um, it really bears no difference in the aspect if you believe that the 2300 days was 2300 years fulfilled in 1844 or if it was fulfilled in the time of the Grecian Empire with the defilement of the temple as shown to us as a typology of what the future little horn was going to do. And so therefore the characters you see in the little horn in Daniel 8 is the characters you'll see in the little horn of Daniel 7. They're essentially the same thing, it's just one is a shadow of the one that is to come. Okay. Um... <clears throat> But the thing is, is, you know, there's different interpretations of that prophecy. Some take it as 2,300 years. Others just take it as 2,300 evening mornings, which actually, actually, that's what Daniel 8 states it is, 2,300 evening mornings. <coughs> it's not literal 24-hour days. So that's why you kind of have to look at that and say, well, you can't really take that 
day for a year because that's not a whole 24 hour day. This is a whole 24 hour day that can be transferred and in, transferred in, into a day for a year. So that's for another study. I'll get into that. But the point is, is that this is 70 weeks. So the whole of this prophecy is fulfilled in either one or the other. You cannot take one of the weeks and say, well, this applies to a separate individual. Because this is the foundational verse describing this prophecy. is Daniel 9.24, and it says 70. Not 69. It says 70. And so when we look at these scriptures, and we find out who this individual is being talked about in these 70 weeks, okay, then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? Because you have people that will sit there and put the 70th week into the future and apply it to the Antichrist. But if you're going to apply the Antichrist to this prophecy, then you have to apply the Antichrist to all of it. And not just one week. Because it's 70 weeks determined upon my people. Now 69... And then a future week is for the Antichrist to fulfill. No. Seventy weeks. The whole of the prophecy is fulfilled by one man. And we're going to see who that one man is. So what were the characteristics again? Finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Well, that kind of just narrows it down, because if the Antichrist is the man of sin, how can he make an end of sins? To make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So let's go ahead and look at finish the transgression. Okay. It comes from the, the word finish comes from Kala, H3607. And it means to restrict by act or hold back or in or prohibit or to finish or to refrain or restrain or be stayed or withhold. Okay. And we can pick up a couple of verses here and actually kind of finish the transgressions and make an end of sin kind of go simultaneously here. <clears throat> so, point number one. Well, we can pick something up in Matthew 121, which states, And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people in their sins. Oh, wait, no. It doesn't say that, does it? It says he shall save his people from their sins. So here we go, this this um, finishing of the transgression. Okay. It means to restrain, to restrict transgression, to withhold transgression. Okay. And so this is what he will save his people. He will save his people from their transgression. Okay. 1 John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay. So, finishing the transgression was destroy, was the Son of God, was the purpose of the Son of God being manifested, so he could destroy the works of the devil, in other words, to finish the transgressions of the devil. So, characteristic number one of the 70 weeks of prophecy, finish the transgression. Does it apply to Antichrist, or does it apply to Jesus Christ? It applies to Jesus Christ. Characteristic number two. 
make an end of sins. Which again, it, this this kind of can fall in line with the same characteristic of the first one we just mentioned. But um, I, you know, I listed it as a se you know as a separate ideal, but in a sense, it really isn't. Um, you know, separate, but you know, I just wanted to divide these up into six lines because I want to look at line upon line here. In Colossians two thirteen through seventeen, it states, "And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses." blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross okay so the handwriting of ordinances when you look at the handwriting of ordinances this is you know something that was penned by the hand of man okay and the and the law of Moses was given by God to Moses to write down and these handwriting of ordinances as you're going to see here in just a moment he took it out of the way nailing it to his cross now is this the law of God or is this the law of Moses this is the key and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moons or of the sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of Christ. Now, okay, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. All right? And if you sinned according to the law of Moses, the Old Testament law, the handwriting of ordinances, okay, which was in context surrounded with meats, drinks, holy days, new moons, Sabbath days, not not the seventh day Sabbath, but there were high Sabbaths and intermingled with these feasts and festivals and these types of things. And there were sacrifices to be done for sin during these days. These were the things that was against us, contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing to his cross. Because for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And transgressing of the law meant death. So, and basically the handwriting of ordinances was the, the law of sin and death. Is what he nailed to the cross. Not the law of God. The law of sin and death. And so this was... And so when Jesus Christ shouted out those last three words it is finished and this is what his ministry was all about to make an end of sins because it states here in 13th verse in Colossians 2 having forgiven you all trespasses right and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moons, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, the substance is of Christ. The substance of these sayings are found in the Messiah. Once the Messiah has come, then therefore the need of observing these sayings, which requires sacrifices and these types of things, was no longer valid. Because he made an end of these things. He made an end of sins. By forgiving you all trespasses. He took upon himself the sins of the world. Remember? Hebrews 9, 24 through 26. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but unto heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
So characteristic of the seventy characteristic characteristic number two of the seventieth week of pro prophecy. Is it about Jesus Christ or is it about the Antichrist? It's about Jesus Christ. Let's go move on to number three. One more verse or a passage here. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, meaning Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering has he perfected forever them that are sanctified. So we went through... One, two, we have four more to go. Make reconciliation for iniquity. This is an interesting one. When you look up the word reconciliation here, it means to purge away, to make an atonement, to disannul, to pardon, forgive. Okay. And so we look at one of these sayings, which was a shadow of things to come, in Second Chronicles 29-24. Okay, and it states, And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar. These were the lambs and oxen and, or whatever, you know, animals pertaining to the use of sacrifice. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. So how was atonement done? Because reconciliation means to make an atonement, it was done via the blood, the blood of the slain animal. And this was to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offerings and the sin offerings should be made for all Israel. Okay, so if these things were a shadow of things to come, and the substances of these things is of Christ, and the blood of Christ was poured out upon the altar, spiritually speaking upon the world so that those that come into the knowledge of Christ and believe on him shall have everlasting life and the life is in the blood well what did he do what did Jesus Christ do well let's go and look at a few things here and let's get our answer because obviously we know that reconciliation means atonement by blood okay Isaiah 53.10 Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Hebrews 2.16-18 Now, this is very interesting because if we take out this word him, because it's italicized, so, you know, it wasn't in the original in these types of things. Um, I usually don't do this, but, you know, in the sense of looking at this verse, I'm not saying it's necessary or not necessary to take it out. It, it doesn't really matter either way. It doesn't um, take away from the divinity of Christ or any of these things. But it is interesting how this is read when you, when you don't include him. And so that's what I'm going to do. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. So Christ did not take on the nature of angels. But he took on the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation, to make atonement for the sins of the people. And how was that done in the Old Testament times? By the blood. Now, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on the seed of Abraham. 
you know what's really fascinating about that? All you got to do is look at the uh, story of uh, Abraham and Isaac. And what was that a type and shadow of? For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So again, obviously this cannot apply to Antichrist, so does Antichrist make reconciliation for iniquity, or is it Jesus Christ? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is three for three. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Now this one is very unique. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment. This is Isaiah 56. 1. Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and thy righteousness to be revealed. So, for my salvation is near to come. If you look up that word salvation, it means Yahshua. For my Yahshua is near to come. And whose righteousness? The Lord, God, the Father. You know, God the Father's righteousness will be revealed. How? Well, let's read about it. How is the righteousness of God going to be revealed? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Philippians 3.9 And be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith. So how is the righteousness revealed? The righteousness of God revealed? It is by faith in Jesus Christ. It is revealed by the revealing of the Son of God. So is Jesus Christ 4 for 4? Or does bringing in everlasting righteousness apply to Antichrist? I would have to say Jesus Christ is 4 for 4. Not leaving much more room for this prophecy to be about the Antichrist now is it seal up the vision and prophecy now remember that I told you when we looked up that word sin and said miss the mark I want you to really pay attention to this because the word seal up here in the Hebrew means to close up to make an end or to mark as in a stamp of approval that this is done. Now we all seen that, you know, Jesus it's Jesus Christ that makes an end of sin. It's Jesus Christ that makes reconciliation for iniquity. It's Jesus Christ that finishes the finishes the, the uh, transgression. It's Jesus Christ that brings in everlasting righteousness. Brings in the Father's everlasting righteousness through the Son. So that's four of them. Now if it's Jesus Christ that seals up the vision and prophecy. And it's a mark. A stamp of approval. That makes an end. Of the prophecy. Especially here in Daniel 9. And there are people that are teaching contrary to what Daniel 9 is actually saying. Then could they be classified as a man of sin? Missing the mark? <clears throat> because they receive not the love of the truth. That they might be saved. For this cause God will send them a strong delusion. That they will believe a lie. That's why I wanted you to remember that Mr. Mark portion earlier in the video. Because seal up actually can be translated as mark and to make an end. Now, if this applies to the Antichrist, 
and then I'm the one in error here, and I need to repent. But does it apply to Antichrist, or does it apply to Jesus Christ? We got two more to go. We got this one and one more. <clears throat> in Matthew eleven thirteen, it states, "For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John." And what did John prophesy? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That John was a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Okay? So all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What were they prophesying about? This is Jesus that was speaking here. They were prophesying about the coming of a future Messiah. In John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it up upon a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. That word, it is finished, can be translated as to make an end and to seal up the vision and prophecy. Because he came to this earth to do what he said it was he, he was going to do. And that prophecy of the 70th week was split in half. How long was his ministry on earth? Three and a half years. Okay. And what did he accomplish in that first three and a half years? He accomplished the establishment of a new covenant. Okay. He established a new covenant. And so therefore, the final three and a half years... Obviously, Jesus was not physically with them, but Jesus was in the apostles, and they continued that ministerial work to the Jews. Because it stated that do not go, uh, that they are to go to the lost house, the sheep of the lost house of Israel. And that's what they did for another three and a half years. Because once Jesus stated it is finished and he gave up the ghost, he was dead. He was put in the earth, and after three days he rose again. Giving us full assurance that this whole prophecy was going to be fulfilled. Because now that a man died who knew no sin, who was perfectly sinless, undeserving of death is raised up therefore that is the sealing up of the vision and prophecy so who is it that seals up or marks the prophecy it's Jesus Christ it's not the Antichrist and so therefore just based on the foundational verse of Daniel 9.24 if you are applying any portion of this prophecy to a future period of time where the Antichrist is going to rule and establish a covenant then you are missing the mark you are missing the mark One more. So Jesus Christ is five for five. Anoint the most holy. That word anoint is from the Hebrew word mashak, which means to spread a liquid or to be anointed. It also comes from the same root word mashiach, which is translated as Messiah. 
Now, let's just pay attention closely here, because let's look at Isaiah 61.1, and it states, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And Luke 4, 17 and 18 states, because this is, uh, and, and this was Jesus. This is Jesus that's going to be speaking. And there was delivered unto him, Jesus, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And he quoted from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So Jesus was speaking of himself. That it was the Father that was anointing him to... Well, let's just go over it again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. To what? Heal the brokenhearted. Preach deliverance to the captives. Recover the sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. And it was the Spirit of the Lord, it was the Father that hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay. Now, who's the most holy? Well, we can even ask an unclean spirit this question, and even the unclean spirit will give us the true, true answer to this. This is very unique. In Mark 1, 23 and 24... And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Even the demons, even the devils believe, and they tremble. <laughs> so, I mean, were they right? Was he the Holy One of God, who was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor? Well, in Luke one thirty four and thirty five, it said, "Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man?" And the angel answered and said unto her, "Said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee." shall be called the Son of God. So here, this Jesus is considered holy, most holy. And one more. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One, and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. So, according to this last characteristic, who is anointed most holy? Is it Antichrist? Or is it Jesus Christ? It's Jesus Christ. Six for six. To make an end of sins. To seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This whole prophecy, all of it, week one through week 70. Week one through week 69 was to set the stage for the revealing of the Messiah. The 70th week 
would be the after. Because obviously, 70 comes after 69, doesn't it? And it was after the 69th week that Messiah is cut off. And when was he cut off? In the middle of the 70th week. That was after the 69th week. Folks, this entire prophecy is centered on one man. As I stated when I first started this. And that one man cannot be the Antichrist. It is and can only be Jesus Christ who fulfills all 70 weeks of this prophecy. And to deny this is to miss the mark that was sealed up by Christ. In the next video, we are going to go into the dates. We're going to go and figure out just exactly when this happened. We've got some other things we're going to go over to. Okay. <clears throat> so, I want to thank you for listening. Truth be told, truth be known. Stay safe. God bless. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.